Thanks. All right. Well, good evening. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. Let me go ahead and take the elephant out of the room. It's going to go back, okay? Goodness sakes, have mercy. When it grows up, it wants to be a big pulpit. <laughs> it looked bigger in the picture, I swear. Yeah, it's a likely story. Look, we're trying to make a, a, a step in the right direction. My vision when I came into the church, when I knew that I would be leading uh, the church as a pastor, I wanted to open up the altar because in a serious note, I feel like oftentimes we put so many things up here that it kind of deters people from coming up here and getting on your knees, which is what this place is supposed to be for. So bear with us as we kind of find a fit. Again, uh, you don't know until you know, and now we know. So um, now that we've done that, taking the elephant out of the room. Let's have some church. What do you say, huh? If you can do so, stand up and praise and worship with us. We're going to sing, Jesus, hold my hand. As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me. Leads me safely through the sinking sand. It is the Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer, dear Lord. Each day to help me do the best I can. For I need thy life to guide me day and night. Blessed Jesus. Well, when I wander through the valley, dear 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father. You could be seated. You could be seated. I want to start the evening. Uh, we would normally open up with prayer, but I'm going to be praying as we uh, can't pray too much. That's for certain. We're going to be praying for, uh, for some of those that may have prayer requests. I want to give you a little prayer request, or excuse me, um, praise report, rather. Sister Hope, come in. Remember last Wednesday, I believe, we were praying for a breached baby? And, well, the very next day, that baby was in the right position for birthing. But it gets better. Hang on, there's more. She come in. Uh, actually, um, Shelly had reached out to me, and I, I completely forgot to share this with others, and then Hope came in with a smile on her face, pretty excited about it. The mom, the young mother that was in a coma, um, they were just about to make the decision to, to let God's will be done and, and pull the plug, I guess, and uh, she woke up. The very next day, she woke up. So I thought, what a wonderful way to affirm with young people the power in prayer. I mean, to, to, to have, I don't mean nothing when I call you a young little hope, but to watch these kids grow up in this church and uh, to see the example that their family has given them throughout the years and for her to come in here um, concerned of, about these kids and these, these, these parents for these children, knowing that the only place that we can really get some help is through prayer and through the Word of God. And I just, I thought it was amazing. I thought it was a wonderful praise report. Thank you, Sister Hope. It did a lot for my soul and uh, just proves there's so much power in prayer. Why, why do we wait so long to go to the Lord in prayer, you know? It's always the last. Let me see if I can figure it out first. Let me come up with some solutions first. And then, all right, well, can't hurt, you know? It should be the first on our list. So, has anybody got a prayer request this evening? Any prayer requests? Yes, Miss Katie. Awesome. Hmm. Mm -mm. Where was he at?
engaged. Yeah, we'll pray for him. We certainly will pray for him. You know, I, one of the things I discussed with one of the prayer table or prayer leaders at our table when we were at the Walk of Emmaus is uh, we often judge a book by its cover. Uh, not intentionally. I think it's just naturally we see what we consider the dregs of society, people on the streets, and, and they're dirty, and they don't, you know, they haven't, whatever. Um, in his experience, he's done brown bag lunches. He, he took it on his own, just felt led by the Spirit to start making 30 bag, uh, brown bag lunches and was going out and talking and, and started developing relationships with these. And he shared a story with me, and he said he went to give this man some lunch. And he said, no, I'll pass on the lunch. You can pray with me, and I'll pray with you. But those people down there, they need it more. And what he started to convey to me and tell me is a lot more of these people are believers than we ever give them credit for. For whatever reason, bad decision-making, uh, bondage, whatever the case might be, it's put them in the situation they in, they're in. We, we should absolutely, I mean, God was no respecter of persons. We shouldn't be either. I think it's wonderful that you approached him and, and shared the love of God with him. I mean, because it's not, we're not responsible for the result, you know. That's just one more watering of that seed that's, yeah, for certain. No, we, had the, we, we don't have anything like that. The insurance is astronomical. That's a completely different conversation. But, um, yeah, invitations are still good, though. It's what we're supposed to do. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Joe, you said was his name? Anyone else? So Barbara said Sister Mary Lou is uh, needing a prayer for healing under the weather. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Praise God. He's at the helm. If we don't ever take our eyes off of him, he'll make sure we see it, I'm sure. That's awesome. Prayer rep uh, praise report for Sister Cheryl. That's awesome. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. He's going to be moving in with you? Is that what you're saying? Or, oh, you're, oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Yes, ma'am. certainly. Linda and Marilyn. I want to remember Brian Crossley. Um, got a lot going on in his camp. Anybody else? Oh, Sister Sylvia. Sister Sylvia was back in the hospital. Had some pretty extensive surgery done. Um, yeah, she was uh, whisked away to the hospital. Uh, some pretty major surgery done and then fighting cancer in the middle of all that stuff so yes miss we will 
Yes, ma'am. Hey, bring it to the Lord. Yeah, I remember when we were praying for this job. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Yes, Miss Ruthann. Anyone else? All right, let's bow our heads. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight with just so many uh, wonderful things to report, Father God. And we just, we just praise you for still working in our lives when we can so get focused on all the negative. Um, you show up. You're good. And you're good all the time, Father God. And we thank you for these wonderful praise reports. We come to you with burdened hearts for uh, the prayer requests that have been laid before us here this evening. Sister Katie uh, has... Uh, Brother David on her, uh, on her mind, uh, reaching out, spreading God's love, um, trying to plant the seeds. Father God, we just pray and increase. Um, there's going to be some new living arrangements in her, in her life, Father God. And we just pray that it sits well with Dad and Katie's sister and the son situation. Father God, we lift it up to you. We pray for Sister Laura and Joe Moore, this, this fellow dealing with Parkinson's, debilitating stuff that changes our life, Father God. Um, completely changes things for us, and we just we just lift him up to you. He's keeping his spirits, Father God. He's saved. He's a child of God, and we just pray that you would bless him, heal him, give him some peace. Sister Mary Lou, um, dealing with uh, being down, perhaps sugar diabetes, Father God, making her weak and, and dizzy and those sorts of things. Just give her a healing touch, Father. Bring her back to us as quickly as you can. Um, Linda in Maryland, um, her husband's legs having to be amputated, uh, the, the independence that you lose when something like this happens, uh, getting reacquainted with how to get about and, and all the things that go with it. Father, we just pray that you'll give them strength to endure, uh, infuse into them some enthusiasm and energy to, to take things in stride, know that you're right there with them, uh, just as important as those crutches as uh, you being right there holding them up, Father God, and we just pray that. We pray for Brother Brian, uh, who's uh, in a fight, Father God, with things that are going on in his life, and just restore him. Let him know that you're there, Father, that you love him. You've never left his side. Bring him back to us in good spirits. We pray for Sister Sylvia, who's certainly in a battle with this cancer to begin with, and then these latest issues, Father. Uh, we just heal her up. Father God, she's a, a wonderful child of God. She's spent so many years singing praises to your holy name, and we just pray for healing and peace and comfort for her right now. We pray for Sister Kay and this CAT scan that's coming up that they would find more out about what's going on, give these doctors and nurses the knowledge that they need to be able to treat her effectively and efficiently. And again, we always lift up Sister Deanna, continue to heal her up through her rehab and be with Brother Jim as he settles into the new living arrangements, Father God, that just let them know that you're still there uh, and bind them up in their relationship and in their love, Father. We just give you all these things. Bless and anoint this entire time, this Bible study, this worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a few praise and worship songs. We may not do all of them, everybody back here, but uh, we will sing a few of them. So if you'd like, stand up and sing with us. Can you believe? Well, can you believe what the Lord has done to me? Can you believe what the Lord has done in me? Will he save me, cleanse me, turn my Just the 
celebrate the Lord. As I stumble in the darkness, I will call your name by night. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are God, you are holy, omnipotent. Father God, so present in our life. If we'll just draw nigh to you, you'll draw nigh to us. And we just pray that right now, Father God. Be with us here this evening as we dig into your word. We'll give you the credit and glory and honor for all the seeds that get planted, all the growing that happens, Father. It's all for your glory. We just thank you for and claim the victory and right now and things in our life, Father God. Again, we lift up these prayer requests. Be with all of these needs, Father God, and all these praise reports. We give you the honor and glory for it all. We just ask that you would be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Amen. Pastor Rick, I made some bad decisions as a pastor. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever <laughs> done this bad. Amen. Bless your heart, brother. Bless your heart. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to be in the book of Ephesians for just a few moments. And uh, probably thinking, well, we're going to talk about the armor of God, but we're really not, but that's kind of where we're going in the scripture. And in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, that's so important what Paul says. Sometimes we read these things, we don't really think about it. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Sometimes we think God wants us to be strong in our own might, but he doesn't. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit saith the Lord. Yes, be strong in the Lord, 
but in the power of his might. In other words, in his anointing. Samson was no good without the anointing of God, was he? Truth is, none of us are. It's God's anointing power that we all need to live this life. Even just to be a Christian, everyday Christian, it takes God, his anointing, his power to help us. But then he goes on, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Remember I, last week I told you that the devil is very crafty. The wiles of the, the devil. He's like Wiley Coyote. Remember Wiley Coyote? Remember the road runner? Always trying to trick the road, always trying to outsmart the road runner. He was, he, all his wiles with his acme stuff, he would try to set a trap for a wily coyote, I meant a road runner, but it didn't work. Well, the devil is just like that. He's constantly trying to deceive us, and he is very wily. He is, he has wiles. He's very cunning. We have to be careful. That's why we have to be sober. We have to be vigilant. Because he's constantly trying to trip us up. And that's why we need the whole armor of God too. In verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's very important. Sometimes we read these scriptures and we think they're so far out there that in the spirit world these things are happening, but we don't really see what's going on. But the truth is, it manifests itself around us all the time. People say, what is spiritual wickedness? Spiritual wickedness is when you get these transvestites in front of little children and try to shape their minds and pervert them. That's spiritual wickedness, and it's in high places, church. These corporations, this is high up in, uh, in the government. It's all over the place. We have to be very careful. You see, it's not hidden from us. It's in plain view if you've got your eyes open as a Christian, it's spiritual wickedness. And now they're flaunting it. You see, no longer is he trying to hide it from us. They're flaunting it right in front of Christians' noses, almost daring you to do anything. But Paul says, stand. Stand in God's might. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray once again for your help. Your anointing, Lord God, we're not here to trash anyone. We're here to open our eyes and see what the enemy is doing in the last days, Father. How deceptive and seductive he is, Lord God. And if we have our spiritual eyes on, it's so easy to see he's become so blatant right in our face. We ask, Father, for the discernment that we need, that we not fall like so many churches are even falling for this stuff, Father. I pray by your Holy Spirit that we will hold firm to your word. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. It may surprise you, but I would like to title the message tonight, Praise. Praise. We're going to find out that we have some weapons to fight the devil with. Not by our might, not by our power. These things are not carnal. They're spiritual, so we have to fight them in a spiritual way. Go to 2 Corinthians Chapter 10. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, and every one of us came in tonight in the flesh. You had to walk in here in this flesh. For we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, Casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing things trying to exalt themselves above God, perverted things. How do we fight against it? With God's weapons. Now, if we read the armor of God, we'd find out that one of our weapons is the the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We need to know the Bible so we can discern right from wrong because we're living in a time when everybody's saying, hey, who are you to say what's right or wrong? You Don't you judge me? And I can say, I don't judge you, but the Word of God judges this situation. The Word of God tells me what's right and what's wrong. I'm not judging you, but the Word of God 
judges. And we have to use it to discern. Or we'll fall into the same thing everybody else is falling into. Well, we don't want to offend anyone. Well, how do you reprove, rebuke, and exhort without offending somebody in the church? Sometimes we have to be corrected. You can't correct someone without offending them a little bit. And Jesus said it's impossible that offenses come. There's going to be offenses, church. We need to put our big boy britches on in the church. I think the church has become just about as guilty as some of these colleges that can't have a lecture get up and speak. We've got to worry, quit worrying so much about our little feelings and worry about what's happening to our country, our nation, our families. The nuclear family is almost gone in America. It's hard to imagine that. It's hard to imagine that, but it's happened right before. So one of our weapons, of course, is the Word of God, the Bible. It's very, very important. And another weapon, of course, is prayer. And you're probably saying, well, Brother Arlen, who don't know that? You know, who doesn't know that? I mean, that's Christianity 101. And it is, and thank God, most people turn to prayer. Even the world many times prays when they get into a bad place. But like Pastor Rick said tonight, too many times we treat prayer as, well, it's the least I can do. I guess I can pray. We forget the power of prayer. It's not like, well, I guess I could pray about it. It's, wow, I can pray about it. I can take this to the throne of God. I can take it to the very throne room of God. He tells me to. And he's a high priest that can be touched by the feelings of my infirmities. And I can go to him, one of them, because the veil in the temple was rent when he died on the cross, making access to the Holy of Holies in heaven. And we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Not cocky, not arrogantly, but boldly with confidence. The Bible says he ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. That's what Jesus is doing. He's living, he'll live forever. And one of his jobs is to intercede for us. He wants us to come talk to him, bring our prayers to him. So, yes, that is a weapon. We need to pray about what's happening in our country. And thank God we have some here tonight even that pray for our country every week. We need that desperately. Jesus taught us how to pray. Prayer is so very important. But most people say, well, that's who doesn't know that very powerful. I'm sorry. And uh, (laughs) Jesus prayed often. Prayer is important. The Word of God and prayer is so important. But sometimes we forget other things that are very, very important too also. And I believe praise is one of them. We don't understand the power of praise. People talk about this church from time to time. It's a very friendly church. Pastor Rick talks about the love gauntlet when you come in. And, you know, and we really do enjoy when Especially new people come in. It's not a, a show. It's not something fake. It's genuine. Really love to see new people and, and everybody come through those doors and hug their neck. Good to see you. It's not some facade. It's not fake. It's real. And we're known for that. People have told me through the years, you have the most friendly church I've ever been in. And I think it's Brother Roy used to tell us, that we'll treat you in so many ways that you bound to like one of them. <laughs> And that's good to be known as that. That's, that's not a bad thing. But I also want people to walk and say, I heard this is a church of praise. I come here this morning because I, I hear this is a church where y'all praise the Lord. You believe in praising God here. You see, I think we're losing that in our country. Praise and worship to Almighty God. I like these songs we talk about, praise the Lord. And I, mean, I didn't plan that. Rick, no, Bill, Brother Bill picked that out. But it's right on point with what God has been laying on my heart. And we need to praise the Lord. And praise is more than just saying thank you. We need to thank the Lord. We need to have a heart of thanksgiving. God expects us to thank him. But I like to think of praise as thanksgiving on steroids. You know what I mean? I mean, there's some exuberance to it. There's life in it. You're you're praising the creator of the universe, of everything. Think about that, church. Sometimes we don't realize he deserves praise. 
My, if he never done another thing, we could praise him for all eternity and not even scratch the surface. He saved our souls. Wow. Thank you on steroids. Try it sometime. <laughs> what is the Bible definition of praise? Let me just read this for you real quick. It's lifting your whole self to him. Your whole self to him. Recognizing that he alone is worthy of our full worship and adoration. When we forget about those about around us, we forget about what's happening in the world. We come to the church to, to worship and praise God. Now, you don't have to be in church to praise God, but thank God we can. David said, in the midst of the congregation, I will praise thee. He didn't say I'd get in my closet every time. That's good to do that. Praise him wherever you're at. But he said, in the midst of the congregation, I will praise the Lord. We could do it. Too many people have been intimidated through the years by the church. Well, now, just calm down now. Just calm down now. There's no need getting all excited about this thing. I mean, he just, all he did was die for your sins, give you eternal life. Come on, put this into perspective, people. <laughs> Amen. Good gracious. Praise is so very, and praise is the correct response to God. When we come together corporately like this, and we start singing songs, we need to praise Him. We need to praise Him. I don't want to sound too flippant, but we need to get our praise on. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. It is the correct, and it is a powerful weapon against the enemy. The Bible says that God inhabits the praise of his people. Amen. You're not going to scare God when you're praising him. He inhabits it. He likes to get right in the middle of it. He inhabits it. He, he abides in it. He loves it. But guess who doesn't like the praise of the Lord? The devil. It expels him. Praising the Lord expels him. Just like light expels darkness. You start really praising the Lord, old devil says, I got to go. I planned on doing some work there in that church, but not this morning. More, they're praising the Lord. They know their Bibles. They're prayer warriors. And boy, they know how to praise. Man, I'm going to go to the next church. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yeah. I would, wouldn't you? I'd work on them. Amen. Look at Isaiah 61 and 3. Rick, you moved my clock. Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> here you go. 61 and 3. A messianic psalm. I mean, messianic word here. Jesus Christ himself in Luke chapter 4, I believe it was, when they gave him the Bible to read the scrolls, this is what he read. This is what they got so angry about him reading. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty of the captives and the opening of prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, oil for joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You ever been depressed? You ever had a, a dark cloud over you? I'm talking about when you come to church. Things haven't gone very well this week or whatever it might be, but you're just feeling down. There's a heaviness. feels like it's weighting down on you. God said, I, I'll take that off and put a garment of praise on. And if you put that garment of praise on, that spirit of heaviness has to leave. It's important, church. Yeah, but Pastor Arlen, I just don't feel like praising the Lord today. Well, let's clear that up too. Look at Hebrews. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13. Notice what it says. Hebrews 13 and 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Did you hear what he said? It's a sacrifice of pride. I don't feel like it. 
Praise him anyhow. Give a sacrifice to God. You see, we have such a weird concept, especially in America. I don't know if it's all over the world. I've never been all over the world. But what he's talking about is they were used to coming to the synagogue. They were used to coming to the temple bringing a sacrifice. They bring a lamb or a turtle dove. The poor people would bring a dove. They brought something. They weren't going to come to church without a sacrifice. And Paul said, now that's all been done. But you still bring a sacrifice. Bring your sacrifice of praise to church. I'm going to church today. I'm going to bring a sacrifice. It's praise. I may not feel like it. Somebody might make me mad when I get there, but I'm going to praise God anyhow. Amen. And it's a sacrifice sometimes. It's not so hard when everything's going great, is it? Hallelujah. But when the doctor gives you a bad report, now that's hard to praise. But the Bible says, praise him. Bring that sacrifice of praise to him. The devil hates it. He hates it, church. And it goes on. Do it continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not, excuse me, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for which such sacrifices God is well pleased. God knows why you feel when you come to church. God knows if you're having a bad day. But it says when you offer that sacrifice, he is well pleased by it. Don't you want to please God? I do. That's why I read the Bible and tried to learn the Bible as much as I could through my Christian walk. And that's why prayer is so important. But praise is important too because it pleases God. The Bible says praise is comely. That means it's acceptable. God loves it. Now, when people praise the Lord and they're not really praising the Lord, they're just putting on a show, that's different. And that happens to some people. I would be afraid to do that if it was just a show. Amen. I mean, I really would be. That belongs to God, people. <laughs> Woo! That praise belongs to Him. But that's between them and God. Don't let that stop your praise and worship. Because there's power. And praise and worship is... is, is it's kind of like the, the flu. It's, it, it's contagious. Everybody starts praising the Lord, and all of a sudden, man, it's like being in a football game, and all of a sudden your team starts coming back. Boy, everybody's in unison. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's power. That's powerful. That's why people go to those places. <laughs> the power of it. But praise is, is just the same. i got to move on. I don't have my clock, so I'm trying to not go too far with you guys tonight. Amen. God inhabits praise, and when it's directed to Christ, if you read Psalms 136, you'll see it over and over. It says, praise ye the Lord for his mercy endures forever. I think 26 times in that one psalm, the great praise is what it's called. Praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. And we better be glad that his mercy endureth forever. Not just for a century, not for a one millennium, but forever, church. We need it. Amen. And when you start thinking of these things, it makes it a little bit easier to praise the Lord. Why is it so important? It helps us to get closer to God from a pure heart when we're really praising God. And once I said it, it chases the devil out of town, at least for a while. He'll come back. But now you've learned a key lesson. I can praise anytime, wherever. You may be at home depressed, lonely, hurting. Start praising the Lord. Try it sometimes. I first got saved, I had a bad habit of cigarettes. And I tried before I was ever a Christian to quit. I mean, I tried. Started when I was 13 years old, smoked for 13 years, tried Numerous times I quit. I could not. I'd try. I'd do good for a while, and I'd get mad about something, go right back. It was just a perpetual. But I gave my heart to Jesus, and I seen an opportunity to witness to a certain person who had looked at me like, I thought you said you was a Christian. You're still lighting up, man. What's wrong with this picture? And I seen it the clearest day, and I said, this is my opportunity to prove to him. I don't have to prove to anybody, but I'll prove to him that, man, what Jesus did for me was real. And I'd find myself on a drag line. Some of you don't know what a drag line is. I used to be a drag line operator, heavy equipment operator. And it's a monotonous job, the most monotonous job you've ever been on in your life. You sit in one seat for 10 hours, and you just get one bucket after another. And done. It is so boring. 
And I would smoke just to pass the time. That was part of it. Now I couldn't do that. And boy, it would just start hours would drag and drag. And I would just think, I want to scream. And I started saying, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You know, all of a sudden that urge, I'd forget about it. And then I remember, oh, yeah. So every time I had that craving, man, I'd sing Amazing Grace, and it'd go away. That was 40-something years ago. Amen? 40-something years ago. Yes, brother, please. Amen. That's why the Bible says sing songs, spiritual songs, hymns, making melody in your heart to God. It is a therapy. It really is. It's a therapy. And uh, I want to go back to Second Chronicles real quick before we close tonight. Just give you a little story from the Old Testament about the power of praise. You've probably heard the story. I mentioned the man's name last week, Jehoshaphat. Oh, King Jehoshaphat, what a, what a great king he was. What a breath of fresh air. I mean, there's so many wicked kings in those days. The world was a wicked place. I mean, there's so much killing, so much death in the Old Testament. Uh, sometimes it's almost overwhelming. Just war after war after war after. That's why they yearned for peace, and that's why when they heard their Messiah would bring peace, that's why it was so good to them because they were so tired of wars. Everything was with wars. And here Jehoshaphat comes. He's serving the Lord, and an enemy comes after him. And notice what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them others beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came someone that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea, this side of Syria, and behold, They'd be at Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all of Judea. Thank God. The Bible says he feared some. Oh, I thought God didn't give us a spirit of fear. This is the good kind of fear. When you tell that you, there's a number coming against you that little Judah has no chance of winning, that will bring fear to your heart. But the fear drove him to God. You see, he understood Wow, we're in trouble. Where do I go when I'm in trouble? He said he sought the Lord. He prayed to God. And that's so key, church, that we do that. That is very important. But that's not how the matter is going to end, just with prayer. That was important. That is a weapon. But it was not the only weapon that Jehoshaphat would use to eventually destroy this army. Amen? Amen. And for sake of time, go down to verse 8. And they that dwelt therein and have built thee a sanctuary. He was talking about how God brought them out of the land of Egypt, basically. He went through there a little bit of a history there, how God has um, helped them through the years and all the, the, how good God is. He said, and there's a sanctuary. It's got your name on it. And you said this to us, God. If when evil come upon us as a sword, judgment or pestilence or famine, we stand before this house in thy presence for thy name is in this house and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. You pray. You, you seek God. You get his ear. And then you say, Lord, I know your promises. Then you stand on the promises of God. Where do you think that song came from? Standing on the promises of God. And this is what they're having to do. They have to stand on the promises. It don't look good in the natural to thank God there's a supernatural. And they said, but God, you promised if we'll do this, then you'll do that. He, they wasn't putting God in a corner. He just said, this is a promise to us, God, and we're going to stand on this promise. That's why Paul said, having done all to stand, stand. Because his promises are yea, and in him, amen. God's promises are always true. He doesn't break his promises. 
Amen? Amen. Amen. So we go on. Verse 14. We're skipping some of the story, but I'll try to bring out the point. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benani, the son of Jael, the son of Mathaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. Church, we need the Spirit of the Lord to come in the midst of our congregation. Amen? And that's why we ask God, Holy Spirit, come. We even sing, come, Holy Spirit, we need you. And we need the Spirit of the Lord. Why did they need the Spirit of the Lord in that day? So that they would hear a word from God, from a prophet. And it goes on. And he said, hearken you all Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. And thou king Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid. Hallelujah. Be not afraid. Remember, he was afraid. And there's an <laughs> unsurmountable army that's going to just wipe us off the face of the map in the natural. He was afraid. He cried to God. You see, when the Bible says we have not a spirit of fear, we don't live in a spirit of fear. We don't live in a constant. You know, you've seen people. I, I, know, I mentioned it with Sister Naomi. She had a sweet spirit. You got around her, she just had a sweet spirit. Have you ever been around someone with the spirit of fear? It comes out of them. They're always afraid. They're always frightful of this and frightful of that. And that's what the, in these end times people are using against the world. All this climate change, I'll be honest with you, is being flamed up by the spirit of fear. That's why the world is by, they're so afraid and they've so convinced them that we're going to go boom. You see, I believe in global warming. The Bible says the earth's going to melt with fervent heat. But it ain't man-made global warming, let me tell you right now. <laughs> Amen. But anyhow, that's the spirit of fear. And that's how the world is accomplishing all the things that they're doing there. They're using that spirit of fear. But we don't have that. And that's why the prophet says, Jehoshaphat, don't be dismayed. Don't be afraid. How can he not be afraid? Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. This is God's battle, church. What's happening, it's God's battle. He's warring with the powers of darkness. Thank God we're in his army. Amen. Thank God he uses us in his army. But the battle is not ours. We're just subjects. And we're fortunate enough sometimes to be a vessel of honor. To be used of God is an honor. Amen. It is an honor. And just for that, we ought to praise him. And he would count us worthy to be a vessel. And in closing, I know I'm probably run out of time here. But just to let you know what happened. Verse 20. And they rose up in the morning and went forth to the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets also, you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that stood and praised the beauty of holiness, as they went out before the army, and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. Psalms 136, over and over, Praise ye the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. That's all you do. Just go out before the army. You're going to sing your singers out before the army? Really? Yeah, because it's not their battle. Notice what happened. You probably already know it. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord sent ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. How, how were they smitten? By, this, by the singers? You mean the singers went out and destroyed this multitude? No. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood against the inhabitants of Mount Seir utterly to slay. And they were so confused they started killing each other. What made them start to praise? The enemy had something planned to destroy them. But praise messed up his thing. Messed up his thinking. That's why I like to think about it. When the devil comes in on Sunday morning and wants to mess up, let's praise him out of here. Amen. Let's praise him right out of the doors. Amen. Amen. Well, I think it's past time. Why don't we stand? I hope I made my point tonight. How important praise is. It is a weapon. Don't just think of it as something to do. It's a weapon. To use against the devil. Amen. 
So let's become not only a friendly church, but a church of praise. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the day that we are living. I know this is perilous times, but they're also exciting times. We see, God, we see your word just fulfilling itself right before our very eyes. We didn't understand how this could ever happen, but now we're beginning to see it. And Father, we praise you for that. We praise you for for giving us the vision, Lord Jesus, for opening our hearts, unblinding our eyes, that we could see the gospel and that you would save us, Father. And as we go here, we ask for you to keep us safe once again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, church. I love you guys. Be careful going home. Amen.